Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I am your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today I'll be speaking with Amanda Plimpton, the Chief Operations Officer for Livestock Labs. Livestock Labs is a tech startup that is creating implantable devices to track the health and wellness of cattle. They spun out of the work of Grindhouse Wetware, a collective focused on human enhancement, and they hope to soon return to the human augmentation space. Amanda has previously spoken at DEF CON's Biohacking Village on the topic of psychoactive chemicals in combat and is well known for her work in the biohacking community. We discuss the path to market for implantable and augmentative devices, the growth of the human augmentation community, and more. As always, show notes and links are available at futuregrind.org. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support. Because of you, this is Future Grind. This episode is brought to you by our friends at VivoKey. Unlike other NFC implants, the VivoKey Spark is not a simple NFC chip. It is a secure link to the future. With the Spark, you aren't just upgrading yourself. You are becoming part of the most advanced cryptobionic community in the world, and your new digital capabilities will keep expanding as the VivoKey platform grows. Find out more at VivoKey.com. Developers, VivoKey is about to launch an update to the platform that enables web standard identity provider APIs, including OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. What does this mean? It means you will be able to enable login with VivoKey support into any web service that uses OpenID, such as WordPress, Discourse, Sugar CRM, and others. Don't miss a thing. Follow at VivoKey on Twitter today. All right, and now we are here with Amanda. And Amanda, I'm very excited for this conversation because you're a key figure in the biohacking community. You're a leader and organizer of many initiatives, and I definitely think that many of the advancements in the community over the past few years are related to your efforts to enable people to come together, work together, and be productive. But how did you even find this community to get involved with? What was the path that led you to biohacking? I was up in San Francisco uh, working at a startup. I'd moved there from Florida, and my then roommate and I were trying to find something to do for the weekend, and we had come across a transhumanist event happening in San Francisco, so we went up to it, and the transhumanist movement has a variety of characters. One of them was up on stage, Rich Lee, talking about grinding and how people were doing things now. They weren't waiting for things to be handed to them. And that attitude really called to me. So I looked into it more. Uh, Maul was also there with implants and I was intrigued. So I got one and I just sort of progressed from there. I found the biohack me forums and just kind of started checking the forums out and interacting there, stumbled across the uh, Grindfest and offered to help with that and just sort of started helping from there. You mentioned that you met Rich Lee and Emil Grafstra at this event, and they are both certainly well-known in the human augmentation community, and both have also been guests on this podcast, Rich Lee in episode 21 and Emil in episode 23. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit surprised to hear that you decided to get an implant at the very event where you first found out about these things. Did you have concerns about getting one? And what was it about this community that spoke to you and made you so eager to get involved? I had previously been interested in wearables, especially like heads up display. I want to have a monitor that's like right in front of my eye that creates like that augmented reality. I've always wanted to be more integrated, more wearable with the technology. You don't have to lug your computer with you. I remember back in the day, LAN parties where people would like lug their computer to someone's house. Now we have our pocket computers that do more for us, but even that we're, you know, it's not as integrated and it made sense that the next, next place that we're going is even wearables and then even implantables, depending on what it is and how it works for people. And so it just, it made good sense. 
So you mentioned that you were working at a startup in San Francisco at the time. Mm -hmm. What was your role at this startup and what was your educational background and path to San Francisco? <laughs> um, my educational background has been a little varied. I went to a couple of colleges. I graduated at the University of South Florida with a degree in international relations. And then I ended up working tech support and working a service desk and then ended up coming over to the startup in order to help grow their support team and then to basically report to the COO and support everything around operations and systems and making sure that the all the connecting pieces in the company were happening. And it turns out I'm good at organizing and systems. So. Yeah, I, I can certainly vouch for your skills in organizing and systems. And I'd love to get into that a bit further, actually. In your answer to my first question, you brought up Grindfest, the annual biohacker meetup in the desert of California, and biohack.me, mm -hmm. the online forums where many of these conversations occur. And I think that your involvement in these two things showed off your skill sets and benefited the community greatly. So tell me more about both Grindfest and biohack.me and how you got involved in a leadership role within these things. Grindfest is an annual event where the, the body augmenting community comes together and it's sort of almost in uh, family style gathering, if you will. And people come to exchange ideas, to do classes, to give lectures to each other. We share information. We try to learn new skills and we have a good time. I just kind of plunged in and asked Cassix if he wanted help because I know that throwing events is hard and I've like had thrown small events and some for the, the company. So I had a, a little bit of idea of logistics and offered to help and he happily accepted and let me come in and help coordinate things. And for me, I think it actually made it a little easier to go to that first grind fest because I felt like I had a thing to do because I'm somewhat of a shy person. And so it was sort of a good way for me to be like, here, I'm doing things. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Yay. And have that good fallback interaction, so to speak. And, and I met just these most amazing, welcoming, I mean, family, really. They just, they're an amazing group of people. And as a female going alone to a new place, especially an event like Grindfest, there's sort of a question mark in your mind a little bit, but it was a completely safe, welcoming, fantastic environment full of creative people who are wanting to do more, be more, create more. They're, they're innovative and they're inventors and they're looking to better themselves and the world. And that just fascinated me and I really appreciated it and I wanted to do more. And so I continued to help with Grindfest. And then during the, one of the, I believe it was the second Grindfest, we started talking about how we wanted to see the biohack.me forums kind of get revamped and keep going and the kid languished a little and the main person who held the domain and such had actually left the community. So worked behind the scenes to bring the domain back to the community and then Technicolor and Bird have been amazing for getting the website up and running and looking better than ever and secure and dealing with all of the things around having the website piece. And now with uh, this new startup I'm at, Livestock Labs, I've had less time to be as involved in that piece. And it makes me sad, but I, as soon as things ease up there, I want to get back in and make sure that we keep going forward and, and can support everyone for the things that they want to see happen. Yeah, and we're going to get into Livestock Labs now. Mm -hmm. But first, you mentioned a few names there, Cassix, Technicolor, and Bird. Yes. And just to get everyone caught up, these are the names used on the biohack.me forums, as well as in real life, for some of the noteworthy people in this community. And Cassix is also the one who hosts the annual Grindfest meetup. And these forums are extremely important to the community. Absolutely. They are where many of us first got to know one another, where many ideas and collaborations get their start, and it's also where the team behind Grindhouse Wetware began expanding. For those who don't know, Grindhouse Wetware is basically a research and development collective that focuses on creating technology to augment human capabilities, and on building a community around these topics. If anyone in the audience would like to find out more about that, you can listen to episode one of this podcast, which features Grindhouse co-founder Tim Cannon, and I'm sure Tim will be coming up in this conversation as well. So Amanda... 
I remember you getting involved with Grindhouse in the spring of 2017, mm-hmm. a few months before there was initial talk of spinning out Livestock Labs. And Livestock Labs would ultimately take on the role of building upon what Grindhouse had created with Circadia, an implant designed to monitor health in real time. But Livestock Labs was spun out to cater to a whole new market. <laughs> but I'll let you explain that a bit further. So what is Livestock Labs? With Livestock Labs, several of the Grindhouse Wetware Collective people came in, as well as a couple of Australians who indicated that the Australian market was ready for some biotechnology. They were ready for implants, but for cattle. They saw a very good need for the health and welfare monitoring of livestock. And so they got together and showed that there would be some grants and there would be some money there and that there was interest. And so the company with Livestock Labs was formed in order to create the product that is called EmbediVet. And the EmbediVet product is an implant that goes into the neck of livestock and it collects their heart rate and their temperature, their pulse, their blood oxygen saturation level and activity levels and, and sends that out. And then it gets crunched up by the servers and alerts and usable data are put onto the phones of the farmers so that they're able to know if an animal is getting a little bit of a fever spike, they can go pull it off of the herd and treat it right away before it spreads illness to the others, gets a distress alert if the calving's gone on too long, that sort of thing. And so wildly different audience than um, having your own little internal Fitbit that could possibly help you detect your own diseases, et cetera, and get you healthier. But Interestingly enough to me, at least, when we talk about the Embedi Vet and what it does, there's a large number of people who before would have gone, ew, you want to put an implant in a person, who are now saying, so does that work in people? I, I feel like there's some sort of mental shift for a lot of people where if it's been proven out in the animals, then maybe it's okay for the people. And I just, I found that fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it's a great way to prove this technology, you know, safe and effective and to make it more acceptable for most people. But before we get into the details of what Livestock Labs is up to, I want to get some of the basics out of the way. So Livestock Labs is essentially now a multinational corporation. You're (laughs) doing work both in Pittsburgh, which is where Grindhouse is based, and in Australia, which is where the company was incorporated. So how did Australia come to be the initial home of Livestock Labs, and what's the story behind its formation? The the formation was actually at DEF CON. That's where the two Australians came and met with Tim. And they had made a decision that if they could find a little bit of funding and get into a, an accelerator program that helps startups, agriculture startups in Sydney, then they would go ahead and start the company. And about a month later, that that came through. And so... The company started in Sydney, went through an accelerator program at Cicada Innovations, the Grow Labs program, and came out of it with an Innovator Award. We're very proud of that. And we got the funding and started moving forward. The thing that we ran into about a year in is that there are visa needs with Australia. And those visas changed just as we formed the company. And so new visas were shuffled around and tried to begotten. And as a result, we ended up having a fair number of the Americans coming back to the U.S. and having to be here for a while. So we sort of ended up forming the impromptu Pittsburgh office. And so we've then developed it as both. It turns out it's healthier for the company to have both. Australia is our first market. U.S. is our second market. So as we develop for our markets, we want to have uh, a footprint on both places. And so we're now a multinational corporation multinational startup, I would say. (laughs) Yeah, and and not only is your startup multinational, but in some ways, so are you. And I'm guessing this was a big change. So what did this mean for you? I imagine that moving to literally the other side of the world was quite a decision. What was that decision process like for you, and what made you decide to go for it? That was actually a a kind of tough decision. I had a you know a good job at a startup in San Francisco, and I saw this as an amazing opportunity, though. It was in the field that I really am passionate about. It's an opportunity to help build technology and 
in in some ways we're we're talking about taking the the biohacker ethic, the the grinder, the body augmenters drive to create and trying to take it into a commercial space for one of the first times and to try and move that forward and see how far we could go and what we could accomplish. And that that appealed greatly to me. And I wanted to to give it a run and give it a try. And so we were able to pay people just enough to be able to get there and survive. And so I went ahead and took the job, packed up pretty much uh, a chunk of my stuff <laughs> and lugged some big suitcases over to Australia and figured that I would end up staying there for quite some time. So you already mentioned some of the metrics that the Livestock Labs implants are capable of gathering, but I'd love to get into some more detail here. What exactly is it that you're creating and how does it work? We're creating a system and the the system is ultimately creating usable data. And it's it's really about the data set that we're creating and providing to the users. And we get there through the technology because the, the information is the important part. People want to know what's going on with their animals, with their livestock. They need to know usable, good intel right away. And so the it starts with the implant. And, and I've already listed off all the things that it does, but it collects all of those metrics and it pushes them out to a base station that collects them. And then that is backhauled over to the servers, which is where all of the alerts ding off. And that's where the, um, the different pieces of information are put together and then provided in different ways to the farmer who needs it. And what's the current state of development? In May of 2018, which was a bit under a year from the date of this recording, an article came out in the MIT Technology Review that mentioned that cows at Utah State University were testing early versions of your implants. How far have you moved past that, and what were the results of these early tests? Um, as with all good early tests, we found various design changes, a few bugs, and uh, iterations that we wanted to start moving towards. And so we then worked on that for both the, the implant and the base station pieces. We've recently, last month, started our next trial with the very latest version, and we're about to start three more trials. We're working with a couple of different farms and then a couple of different universities in order to do various trials. And we're basically moving through the stages of do your internal trials, do your research trials, do your commercializing trials. And so we're just kind of moving through those stages, making sure that we're constantly improving the product and getting as much feedback as possible to make it as a usable and pleasant experience for the animals and the people. And how are you analyzing and processing this data? Is there any machine learning or artificial intelligence being used? Absolutely. Uh, it, it sounds so buzzwordy, but we do have the machine learning, artificial intelligence piece that's been uh, developed out. Primarily, the, the main driver there has been Lexi, and she's done an amazing job of building out the, the different algorithms that do some of the calculations as well as the actual machine learning that's going to be producing these insights, as we like to call them, regarding either what we do know and want them to spot or the things that we don't know yet. And those are going to be the, the most interesting. We're, we're very keen to see what the uh, unsupervised learning might produce for us as we get the larger and larger data sets. And what does the path to market look like? Is this available for sale or for pre-order or what's the timeline there? We're at the starting of the commercializing phase, so it's, it's in a sense, in a pre-order. We're working with specific uh, targeted customers, um, the ones who've been vetted and are going to be a good fit for the product, and then they will be trialing it out and letting us know. And then we have increased interest in different areas. We're trying to basically make sure that we get good, we qualify all of the deals that are coming in and, and look for the the right fit. The, the the saying is that you don't starve, but you drown as a startup. People get interested and then suddenly you get a huge flood of orders. So we're trying to make sure that we're being strategic about how we move forward. We want to get partners and channels. We want to make sure that it's we're rolling it out in a, a sane way that we don't overpromise and underdeliver. The thing about the farmers is that they have a reputation or a stereotype that they're actually anti-technology, and we've found that to not be true at all. Instead, farmers are very pro-technology, but they're pro-technology that actually works. 
the they switched out using oxen for tractors for a reason. That technology works. And so we want to bring that technology that works that's going to make their lives easier and hopefully bring greater value and productivity to the farm. And so we're 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 pursuing that with all of the the technology forward farmers who are into it. And there's actually a fair number. You mentioned that you are currently identifying partners to work with to bring this to market. To me, it sounds like you might be in a phase in which fundraising would be important. Uh, what has this aspect of the business been like? How do investors react to what you're doing? Like all startups, we've gone through funding rounds where um, we've closed through the seed round. We're about to start Series A. Series A is usually for commercialization. And so and we have opened that round and we're going to be seeking the Series A funding. Tim Cannon, the CEO, is primarily in charge of that piece. He's the one who has to, as I tell him, go out and shake his moneymaker and get us some money. Might be a little on PC. I should probably stop saying that now that I say it out loud. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're in the process of getting the Series A funding secured. And the the partnerships, we're we're looking at a couple of different ones. There's some strategic ones where we might pair with someone else's product, and that could be a, a good way in. There are some smart farm opportunities that we're looking at. We want to try and make sure that we're working with all the right people in all places. Okay, so Livestock Labs is an ag tech company. Uh, the devices are planned to be used in cows for mm -hmm. the benefit of farmers. Yes. But this is technology that was and is created by people who are interested in human enhancement. From my involvement in the early conversations when Livestock Labs was first being founded, it was pretty clear that the goal was ultimately to bring this technology back to humans. Is there a roadmap for that? And do you currently have any idea of whether or not that would be done under the banner of Livestock Labs or through another entity? When we talked about it in the beginning and as we've continued on, there's always been a, it's not a spelled out plan, but one of the goals is as we move forward, we want to make sure that there is a path to, back to the human. Whether that stays with the company or it sends out, it really depends on the future of the company. There's a bunch of different ways it could go based on the future of the company. But yes, the uh, coming from that background means we have a very strong interest in making sure that the technology does go back and that it's not just hogged, so to speak, inside the uh, agriculture community. Now, I know that there are many people in the biohacking community that are eager to be among the first to experiment with and test out new devices. And the EmbediVet implant seems like one that many of them would like to get. <laughs> so has there been any talk of human testing, official or otherwise, of the EmbediVet implants? And are there any plans for that to happen? I believe my official answer is supposed to be no. Yes, of course. But you know, you can't control what some people decide to do. So if one of these fall off a truck somewhere, maybe something else will happen. <laughs> but we'll have to see about that. Exactly. So as you know, people involved in the biohacking community are quite anti-authoritarian. Uh, yes. <laughs> they want to live their life on their own terms, and uh -huh. they don't tend to give much thought to the rules. Yes. And your job is making these people, who are highly intelligent and highly driven, and have them form a team in which they can work together and sometimes take direction from someone else. And that someone else is often you. How have you managed this seemingly impossible task? I have, in fact, made reference to herding cats before. And it's, it is not quite as hard as it's made out because people are so driven and passionate and multi-talented and skilled and interested in learning new things. One of the th things about Livestock Labs is that uh, there was a mixed level of people coming in in terms of their professional experience. I had already experienced some of the startup life and some of the building of that process. Tim had gone through it a little bit. And then Bird had had some professional experience working in universities, et cetera. So there's part of it was not just the developing of the company, but the developing of the professionals and us as a team and us as individuals trying to get better at our jobs that we're new to. And so that's that's actually been one of the transformations I've been so impressed and delighted by is just how amazingly talented and how everyone has grown into their different roles and 
how it's been, uh, it's been a process and a struggle, but we've, we've done it together. And I feel like everyone has leveled their game up and added new skills that they wanted and have been able to grow into these things. Not to say we didn't make mistakes and won't continue to, that's just part of being human and moving forward in life, in your career, et cetera. But I think that it's it's a very doable thing. It is it is hard because there is a it's not just the part where you work together because the Grindhouse Wetware Collective, thankfully, had already kind of gotten this group in part used to working together. But it's the working together in a corporate environment for a company. And we started out as a startup where it's kind of less structured, strictured. So we were able to kind of attempt to build the things that we would like to see for our company in order for it to function and grow but maybe not be quite as restrictive as other large corporations would be. And that's, I I think, honestly, something that a lot of startups tend to strive for. That's why they have all of the, you know, we have beer on tap and a ping pong table. They're trying for that, that vibe. So what you're really doing here is bringing biohacking technology into the market. And Emil Grafstra's Dangerous Things and VivoKey are probably the most noteworthy commercial entities to form from these ideas. And they are doing some extremely interesting work. Yes. But you're really blazing trails with Livestock Labs as well. So what are your thoughts on bringing what many see as an amateur or hobbyist interest into professional businesses that make and sell products, have investors, etc.? I think that it is very hard. I think it's very difficult. And I think it's very rewarding. And it's it's something that we should strive for if people have the right preference and mentality and skill for it. We should absolutely, there are parts of the community that should be pursuing it if that is what they would like to do. It is not something that one should casually engage in, shall we say, (laughs) because there are so many moving pieces and so many liabilities and compromises that have to be made to get to the being a company status. But I think that when people say amateur, it's, I don't feel like they're giving it the, the true value. When we talk about the citizen science that the body augmenters are doing, there are a number of people who are working with rigor and with intention to create an amazing product that they want for themselves. And then maybe other people might want to. And I think that we should honor that part of it. There's always going to be other people who are less rigorous, but the, the ones who continue to pursue and innovate seem to be the ones that also are the m- most keen on making sure that it's a, a safe and usable and somewhat user-friendly product. You mentioned liabilities there, and these are huge legal questions. There's also a question of regulation. Grindhouse Wetware, as you know, had prototype devices of both North Star version 1 and North Star version 2 that, with a bit of work in the funding for a manufacturing run, perhaps could have been ready for wide public release. But that never happened, and the questions around regulation and liability were a huge reason why. There's really no clear path to market for augmentative implants for humans. Are they medical devices that would need to be cleared by the FDA? Are they similar to body modifications, which exist in a legal gray area in many cases? There's not clear answers. But what have your experiences been like in the animal market? Are there clearer answers to these questions there? The animal market in some ways is similar that it is a specifically for animal implants is more of a gray area because at this time there are no biological components like the the other implants out there are hormone pellets and that has its own regulation and such. But something that is a mechanical device that is properly biocoded and and tested going into an animal doesn't really have a regulatory home. And part of the thing that we've been doing is reaching out to all of the agencies and checking in to see where this device falls, if it is under their auspice, and can they let us know what we need to do to be compliant. And aside from the normal mechanical testing around like the radio pieces and and all of that, just the normal things that you would do for any device, there hasn't been any agency that has said that we need to be necessarily registering with them and going through the process. It's not to say that they're not interested and working with us, but it's we just don't officially fall into any of the, the domains, which happens with new technology, as you know, all the time. So it's important to us that we stay in touch with all of the agencies and let them know the progress and that if at any time they want to work with us further on it, we're happy to work with them on it. In the meantime, we're pursuing as many 
safety testing and regulations and compliances as we can get a hold of. We're trying to hold ourselves to the higher standards, if you will. Sure. And it's not just the human augmentation or implantable device markets that are facing these issues. Autonomous vehicles, drones, space flight, AI, and more are all industries that seem to be outpacing laws and regulations. And this Mm -hmm. leads to a lot of confusion, and we really need to solve these issues. Absolutely. So one of the main features of the biohacking community is the strong support for the open source movement, the sharing of information and ideas, and learning from one another. And some of this seems to be inherently at odds with protecting the intellectual property of a for-profit enterprise, such as Livestock Labs. How do you balance this desire to share information and help others while also fulfilling your perhaps legal obligations to investors and shareholders and bringing a product to market? That is something that we discussed within the group, uh, especially the ones who are biohackers who have come over to the commercial space. We're trying to navigate that carefully. We want to make sure that we always meet all of our legal obligations and that we are acting in the best interest of the company when it comes to the the IP and the, the tech that is with it. But that's not to say that the skills that we're learning aren't something that could be shared. We're not sharing the IP, but maybe let's talk about PCB board design. Let's talk about this skill. Let's talk about that. And sharing the, the, the skills that will allow other people to build their own thing is one of the ways that we can try to address that. And there are some in the group that will always feel that the IP is uh, inherently not good. But in in some ways for the community as well, having defensive patents is not a bad idea. One of the things that we should be aware of as a community is that there's a chance that if we start building things in our nonprofit collective sort of way, there's a chance that someone else could patent it and then try to cease and desist us on our own IP. And so there is something to be said for holding it. And then you can either make it open because you're not a company who is beholden to shareholders and trying to make the money on it, or you could go the Elon Musk way and eventually open the patents up. There's a lot of avenues there depending on what makes sense for the community or the company and the people involved. Those are extremely great points. I think the idea of a defensive patent is very important and one that more people should consider. So going back to something you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you said that you got an implant at the event where you first learned about the world of biohacking. I assume that was an RFID tag. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you end up using that for? And what other implants or modifications have you had since then? The the RFID I do still have. It's um, I've used it as a password, two-factor auth kind of thing on various systems and points in time. I'm not currently using it that way, so maybe I shouldn't count it that way. But it was a... um, good that in that sense um i also have the nfc on my in my other hand and that one mostly just has a timer at the moment i haven't been playing too much with it i have two of the fireflies the v1 and the v2 and those are the tritium ones that light up in the dark so that they are or not light up in the dark but you're able to see them in the dark you're always glowing it's only you can see them in the dark and those are the most popular. They, their function is to be decorative, I admit, but they're the ones that people really, I get dragged into so many bathrooms because I have no windows so that we can shut the door and they can see them. <laughs> and then I have a finger magnet, of course, and that one's the most useful because I'm able to sense the electromagnetic fields and pick up screws in the little corners of the, the server racks. And I helped diagnose my grandmother's stove not working one time, just all the random little things that you don't know, you know, and it's been, it's just, it's nice to have that extension of the senses in order to kind of operate in the world. And then I have two experiment coding magnets that are, we're waiting to see how they go. And I just got the Spark and I haven't actually gotten to play with that yet because I've been running around like crazy, but I'm very excited to start uh, checking into that one more. I think that's all of them. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a few. Just to walk the audience through some of these You mentioned an NFC tag. Uh, NFC stands for Near Field Communication and is essentially a high-frequency RFID tag. And the Firefly implants are similar in size and shape to the RFID tags, but as you mentioned, they are filled with tritium, 
a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, and they use radioluminescence to shine visible light through the skin. So yeah, they are very visible in dark rooms. The last implant you mentioned there is the VivoKey Spark, which is Amol Grafstra's next generation NFC cryptobionic implant, and I'm very excited to see what the future holds for these. The potential for this technology is huge. So yeah, there's no shortage of interesting devices there. But all of the implants you mentioned are passive. Right. So what Grindhouse Wetware has focused on and what Livestock Labs is currently focused on are powered implants. Yes. What are the roadblocks you see to the adoption of these powered devices? Well, inside the community, we can discard the squick factor. Outside the community, the squick factor. Um, aside from that, it's going to be the battery, of course. It depends on what you're intending the device for and how much power it consumes. If you want something that's active and actively interacting, it's going to be chomping through the battery and you'll need to be making it reusable. And then that has size constraints attached to it because there's only so small you can make the battery and so rechargeable in order for it to function for periods. And I think that some of the early devices that we come out with will either be like a reduced feature set, so it's not quite so power hungry, or people will be tolerating having to charge it more often than they would really like. Kind of the way the the Fitbits and such, people, they have to charge it every day or every other day. Whereas some of the other brands like Garmin, I only have to charge it once a week and the previous model, it was once a month, which was fantastic. I would love it if our internal active devices only needed charging once a month, but I can't even imagine what that combination of rechargeable battery and sipping power off to be able to do the things that they want to do, how that would, how we would get there. But I think that power and the consumption of power by our, our hungry, hungry devices is going to be one of the major constraints. So something we touched on multiple points in this conversation is your skill as an organizer and as someone who can step into leadership positions. You've done a great job creating some semblance of structure for events comprised of people who are largely independent, which is impressive. But how can we grow this in the future? What does the biohacking community need to move forward? That's an excellent question. And it's, it's a very tough one because it, it's essentially the answer is it needs the community. The, the people are the ones who drive this. As we bring people in, if we retain them and then they contribute and then uh, we bring more people in and everyone keeps contributing and growing it outward. And I think part of that is naturally occurring because we are an inclusive, welcoming environment that we're like, oh, you're interested in this too? please come on in. Oh, you, you have an idea. Let's check it out. And I think as long as we keep that part of the community going, that we'll be able to keep growing. I don't think that we will hit a tipping point and jump into the, the mainstream anytime soon, because what we do isn't quite there in the culture zeitgeist, but the people that find us that get it, I think we will keep collecting them. And as all of these talents come in and grow, we'll continue to see the community grow and do amazing things. So let's say that someone in the audience has heard this interview and is interested. They want to find out more about this community and perhaps get involved. What's the best way to do that? The starting point, of course, would be the biohack.me forums. There's a wiki that we need to update. And uh, there's also a Slack channel that can be joined. And so there's different ways to interact with people that way. And from there, going to the different events where people are at, and those are usually talked about on the forums as well. I, I would love to also see more events happening locally or regionally so that people would be able to be more inner, uh, be able to meet in person. I think that that has a strong draw. And in the West, we have Grindfest that happens in the April, May timeframe. And then in the central, we have Texas with body hacks. And then again, more in the Southwest, we have Vegas with DEF CON that happens more in, I believe, the August range. And so we're sort of lacking on the East Coast side. I actually, when I have a little more free time, want to start the an East Coast convention, uh, Biomake. And I think that that would really be a good, good thing to have on this side of the, the world as well, so that we can have people getting to the, the regional enclaves once a year. And if you can make it to more than one, then you're, you're able to interact directly with the people that you're normally chatting with. And I, I think the face-to-face -face is helpful. I'll put links to all of those things in the show notes at futuregrind.org. And now for anyone who wants to follow along with you or your work with Livestock Labs, how can they do that? Right. 
we have the embedivet.com website that has various contact information if people need to directly contact Livestock Labs. Otherwise, we do have somewhat of a social presence. I have been actually more active on Twitter recently um, as I'm Cyberless. That's my handle on the forums. And in real life, I answer to both equally. It works out just fine. And I think those are the, the main ones, are the, the easily accessible ways. And then, of course, going into the forums, you'd be able to to find me and, and all of the other amazing body augmenters that are almost always happy to, to lend an ear and give a suggestion. Well, thank you, Amanda, for joining me on the podcast. Both you and Livestock Labs are well-known and respected in the biohacking community, but have largely flown under the radar outside of it. So I'm excited to be able to highlight and recognize some of your work. And thanks again for making that possible. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey everyone, Ryan O'Shea again, and thanks for listening to my interview with Amanda. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. We'd also like to again thank our sponsors at VivoKey for making this episode possible. Unlike other NFC implants, the VivoKey Spark is not a simple NFC chip. It is a secure link to the future. With the Spark, you aren't just upgrading yourself you are becoming part of the most advanced cryptobionic community in the world, and your new digital capabilities will keep expanding as the VivoKey platform grows. Find out more at VivoKey.com. Developers, VivoKey is about to launch an update to the platform that enables web standard identity provider APIs, including OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. What does this mean? It means you will be able to enable login with VivoKey support into any web service that uses OpenID such as WordPress, Discourse, Sugar CRM, and others. Don't miss a thing. Follow at VivoKey on Twitter today. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Future Grind.